By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back to the Camel Trophy, the old school magic tournament of Arnhem. And this is episode three from that event. And we're back with another beautiful match. We're going to look at Peter's Alpha deck. It's white, it's um, green, and it's red. It is cool, man. I've got a lovely deck photo in a moment for you. And he's playing against Rob. And Rob is playing with a Serendip, a Freed Serendip Gin, a Lantex, blue and white deck. Super cool deck. He's playing with a full playset of Serendip Gin. So I'm looking forward to show the deck photo to you. But before I do, before I start with the deck deck, I would just like to point out that as always, you can also skip that section and go straight to the games. I know some of you enjoy doing that. The easiest way to do that is by checking the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and it'll take you straight to the action. And the description below is also quite handy to find information about the rule set that we're playing. I can already tell you that this in this tournament, they are playing according to the gentleman's rule set. That means no Library of Alexandria, Alexandria and no Mind Twist at this tournament. Okay, and now we're going to start with the deck deck. I'm going to start with the deck of Peter. Let's take a look at this Alpha Brew. And here we see the deck of Peter. So as you can see, it is completely alpha, which I think is super cool. Um, he's playing with white, I think, as his main color, right? He's got three Sarah Angels, three Swords to Plowshares, three Disenchants, Wrath of God, and a Balance. So there's a lot of destruction in there. He's also playing with three Lightning Bolts. He's playing with a Fork, an Earthquake. So, I mean, this is looking like a pretty solid deck. And then he's got a little bit of green added to it in the form of Regrowth. He's got some Birds of Paradise for some ramping. He's got some Giant Groves, which can go quite well, I guess, with uh, with his plan to maybe attack with Sarah, put a Giant Grove on it. What I also like in the deck, by the way, is the Hive. The Hive is five to cast, and then you can pay five and tap to put a 1-1 one, one Flyer a token on the battlefield. Now, this may seem quite steep, right? Five mana for a 1-1 one, one Flyer, but you have to remember that back in the day, it was quite magical that you could create a creature out of nothing. The, the whole... The whole world of tokens didn't really exist yet, right? This was the first token card. So it, it, it it's pretty cool. They, they weren't really sure about the power level. If, if you let someone just create a creature out of nowhere, what consequences could that have on the game? So this was really a revolutionary card, right? We also see Channel Fireball in this deck, which is always risky. When you play against a Channel Fireball player, it's risky, especially in combination, of course, with the bolts, right? Because he can kind of, if he's behind on life, the bolts can make sure that his opponent is just a little bit lower, and then all of a sudden the Channel Fireball works again. So, you know, it's only alpha cards, so the deck is a little bit linear, but there's still, I mean, there is a lot to it. What, what I'm also liking, by the way, the last thing I'm going to say about this deck before we jump over to the deck of Rob is that one black card in there, the Demonic Tutor, which is pretty cool because he only has, I believe, one Bayou as a dual land to cast it, but he also has the three Birds of Paradise, of course. So, I mean, I, I would it would be pretty cool to see Peter kind of cast that, that Demonic Tutor with such a weak mana base. It is possible. I mean, he does have, technically speaking, four ways to get to a Black Source with the Bayou and the three Birds of Paradise. And perhaps under that Bayou, it's, it's a little bit difficult for me to see, but that's a bad land, so that would be uh, Black Source number five. So it's, it's, it's possible. Anyway, a beautiful deck, Peter. It's really cool you brought an alpha deck to this tournament. And uh, I'm just curious to see how it's going to do against Rob. Let's take a look at his deck. And here we see the deck of Rob. So the first thing I notice here are the four Serendip Jinn. So Serendip Jinn, super cool creature, but very volatile, very risky to play with. Uh, it's two blue and two to cast for a 5-6 flying, right? So that's amazing. But then... It's got a hefty cost because at the beginning of your upkeep, you got to sacrifice a land. And if you sacrifice an island this way, Serendip Jinn deals three damage to you. When you control no lands, sacrifice Serendip Jinn. So you can have a scenario where you only have one little island. You got to sack your last island to the Serendip Jinn. You take three damage and then the Serendip Jinn is also destroyed, right? That would be like your nightmare scenario. Luckily for Rob, he's also playing with four Lantex. And Lantex and Serendip Jinn, they go together so well because... Uh, Lantex says if you have less lands than your opponent during your upkeep, you can look up three basic lands, show them to your opponent, then put them into your hand. So it's ideal to have like an active Lantex and a Serendip Jin on the table because, you know, Lantex is going to make it super easy for you to keep feeding lands to your Serendip Jin. And remember, Serendip Jin has five powers, so 
you after four swings you've dealt your 20 points of damage and your opponent should be dead right so it should work but it's quite risky so it makes sense that that uh, you know rob's kind of built the control package around this strategy you need some reliability about around this volatile strategy so he's playing with you know your swords to plowshares your counter spells your disenchants balance which is a great card to come back from behind uh, i also like the, the the synergy between balance and Surrender Jin, because with Surrender Jin you're losing a lot of lands, but in some weird way you can make that turn that into your advantage with a well-timed balance, kind of using balance as this Armageddon card strategy. So, so I, I'm liking that as well. I'm curious to see if he can can pull that off. He's also playing, of course, with the Blue Power, the Ancestral Recall, and uh, with the Time Walk, and then he also has Four Savannah Lines and Four Surrender uh, Afrits, which is of course the Line Dip kind of strategy or as some people call it the fantasy zoo strategy so he's he's got that going for himself as well so i kind of see the control deck i see the line dip deck and i see the lantex surrender gin plan in this deck so it's kind of three decks in in one you could say and um yeah i'm, I'm just really excited to, to see surrender gin i think it's a it's a beautiful creature and um let's see how it does against the deck of Peter. let's go to the match Game number one on the right, Rob with his blue and white Surrender Jin Lantex plan. On the left, Peter with his all alpha deck, starting with a Birds of Paradise. That's a great start for Peter. Are we going to see a quick swords, for example, on the birds? Both players, of course, starting on 20, just a planes and a pass. Is there going to be a follow up by Peter? There is a bad lance. He's got one Demonic Tutor, that's his only black card in there. It's a good one, of course. And there we see a Surrender Perfreed. So early pressure. Are we going to see a Swords to Plowshares? Looks like Peter is changing his mind, though, untapping the birds again. Perhaps he wants Rob to first take some damage. He's going to play a Bolt on the life total here of Rob. Going to put him on 17. Then if he would play a sword, he would go back up to 20. Let's first see what Peter can do. Playing a plane. So he's got all the mana he needs, which is good. There's the Demonic Tutor. Finding that single Demonic Tutor in his deck. That is good news for him, having and the black mana and, of course, the Demonic Tutor. I kind of talked about it in the deck deck, seeing that one little black card in there. And there we see a sword. Okay, taking care of the bird, sorry, of the uh, freed. But unfortunately, he doesn't have like any creature to put on board as well. And I think another line of play, but I don't know what amount of mana he's got in hand would be to maybe go for a Sarah Angel. Because Sarah Angel, of course, is a great card against the Surrender uh, Afrit. There we see another Surrender Afrit though here by uh, Rob, so continues putting on the pressure there's another bolt though so rob's gonna drop to 17 again are we gonna see a sarah angel now tapping four for a gem day tome that's not too shabby but i'm sure if you're Peter, you would have rather had a sarah angel here there's the attack he's on 20 can still take the damage probably gonna drop to 17 here So he's dropping to 17. There's another island. There's a Mox. I believe it's an Emerald. Kind of hard to see with the glare. Tapping to Disenchant on the book. Oh, that is unfortunate for Peter. That is quite tough. Another Surrendip. No Surrendip Jinch yet. Only a Freed. The third Surrendip Freed already being played out by Rob. And I kind of feel that. Peter is very unfortunate having to deal with all these surrenders. He was able to destroy the first one. Another bolt there. Rob dropping to 13. Does Peter have, for example, a Wheel of Fortune in hand? Is that the reason why he's just playing those bolts so aggressively? We see Rob here dropping to 11 because of his own surrenders. There's an attack for 6. He's going to go to 11 as well. So 11 against 11. But the board's looking quite well for Rob. There is the Surrender Jin 5 6. Card from Arabian Nights as well. So Surrender Afrit and Surrender Jins on the board here. 
Another mountain for Peter. It's not looking good for him. Yes, he can at least jump lock for once with the birds. But then he'll still drop to five. There we see him tapping three, tapping four. What are we going to get? No, he's changing his mind, untapping again. What is he going to do here? Tapping a green, a fireball. Is he playing a fire? Oh, he's playing a fireball on his own birds. That means he's got a balance in hand, probably. Now he's going to play a balance. Oh, balance. Are we going to see a counter spell, though? No, he doesn't have two blue. At least he's got the swords. So he sorts his own creature to go back up to 16. But this balance is marvelous. This is the lifeline that Peter needed. So Fireball on his own Birds of Paradise, followed by a balance. That's kind of getting him back into this game. Rob now in top decking mode, and I believe Peter is as well. Let's see what they're going to draw. Tapping four, there's a Jade Statue. But a counterspell on the Jade Statue here by Rob. Drawing a card, passing turn again. And I, to be honest, I thought Peter was toast, but that balance changed everything. He's also playing with one Wrath of God, I believe, in his deck. So Wrath is another one of those cards that can get you back. And both players just, you know, drawing cards, passing turn. Four cards in hand already for Rob here, but he cannot really find anything useful. Perhaps he's got a lot of um, solutions in hand, like Swords of Plowshares, Disenchants, Counterspells. There is Chaos Orb. And a pass. And also Peter not doing much. Okay, there's a Savannah Lion. So that Savannah Lion can at least deal some points of damage to Peter. Peter being on 11. And there we see a Jade statue. Are we going to see a Counterspell or a Disenchant? I'm kind of expecting something here. Yep, there's a Counterspell here from Rob. So Rob probably just having a lot of answers in hand. There's a Fireball on the lion. It's of course interesting to think, would you've played the fireball first and then the jade statue? So that maybe your jade statue is encountered. Then again, you know, Rob's got a lot of solutions to artifacts in his deck, especially artifact creatures having access to disenchanted swords. So these are, are the questions. And of course, Rob also had the chaos orb. So perhaps it was better to play the jade statue first. There we see a city of brass and a pass. He's tapping. What is he going to tap? It's kind of hard to see with the camera, unfortunately, because of that angle. But I believe he's tapping two white. Okay, there's the hive. So he's tapping five mana for the hive. There, oh, a divine offering. That is painful because it's going to give, uh, going to give Rob five life. He's going to go up to 21. It's such a great target for Rob to play that uh, divine offering on the hive. And the Hive, of course, such a beautiful card, such an epic card in old school. There's a land tax. I wonder if you can actually use the tax. Two, five, seven. And I believe more, I believe eight or nine lands on the side of Peter. So he can start using the land tax. And that is good news because if you're Peter, you want to find um, creatures. You want to find something to put pressure on the board. And uh, there are three basic lands. And he can now shuffle up. And if he can find a surrendered Jin, and if he can stick to the board, that would be great for Rob. So drawing the three basics and drawing, a, or getting the three basics and drawing a card for turn, I should say. Playing out a planes. And passing the turn, it seems. There is a soul ring here by Peter. And passing the turn. So Peter just not doing a lot. And he tried to do a few things, but it got countered away by Rob. And um, yeah, that's a little problematic for Peter here because he's really giving Rob all the time he needs to kind of rebuild after that balance, you know, to find his surrender gins. He's got so many lands now. 
So those are the three lands and drawing a card for turn. So I believe he's got 11 cards in hand at the moment. He's probably going to discard a couple of basics here. Or is he going to play something out? Are we going to see, okay, a Cyblast here on the life total of Peter going to drop to seven. That's, of course, a way to win the game as well. He's got, I believe, multiple Cyblasts in hand. He's going to discard two basics, I believe, and pass the turn, so seven in hand. So Peter had a pretty good start with Birds of Paradise, Demonic Tutor. And of course had that good balance answer. But it looks like he only can find lands after that. And look at that, the last basic in Rob's deck. I mean, land tax is just so good. So finding his last basic and now drawing a card for turn. Playing the planes. But no creatures, it seems. Is he now forced to discard a card? Discarding a basic, there are planes and a pass turn. So, wow. So after that balance, we've really been in some kind of constant standstill. There is a mox. Yeah, that's, that's not going to do anything here for Rob. So playing another land passing turn. And actually, Pater doing the same. I mean, they need a living plane. There's an ancestral recall trying to dig even deeper into the deck, trying to find some substance. And then I guess he can draw for, for turn, right? Or didn't he play the ancestral recall on end step? I mean, if we look at the creature base of Rob and what he still has in the deck, I mean, he still has his Savannah Lions in the deck. We haven't seen those. He still has one Surrender Pafrit and he still has three Surrender Jinn. So I'm a little bit surprised that he cannot really find anything after drawing so many cards. And remember, there are no basic lands in his deck anymore. And now he finds a Lotus. Really cool Black Lotus, by the way. Very beat up copy. It probably saw some, uh, some sleeveless play back in the day. And now we see, I mean, Rob looking at his hand, he's like, what can I do? I mean, that hand's got to be chock full of like swords to plowsiers and disenchants and counter spells and whatnot. It, it looks like he's going to tap something. Are we going to see a brain geyser? That would be kind of insane. What is he tapping the mana for, though? Oh, he's going to play a recall. That is actually really good. Because he can just discard all his lands that he doesn't need anyway. And he can get creatures back. Now, remember, one of those surrenders was uh, removed with the Swords to Plowshares. But he still has two Surrender Befreets in there. He can get those back. I would just get both of them back, to be honest. And he's getting, okay, I guess that's, that's, that's better. It's more defensive, but it's probably better getting the counter spell back. That makes sense. So now he's going to play out that Surrendip. And of course, he still has the Ancestral in hand and passing the turn. There's a Swords, though. Is he going to counter? The, he is going to counter the Swords. Okay. He could have maybe thought, okay, you know what, just destroy this and I'll, I'll draw into a Surrendip, whatever. There's a Soul Net. That is really cool, the Soul Net. There's a Wrath of God. That works really nice with the Soul Net. I'm liking this. And what is he doing? Okay, he's playing Ancestral Recall. It's kind of hard to see with the camera position, but he's playing Ancestral Recall. Uh, wow. That is so funny, gaining a life from the Soul Net. I love that Soul Net Wrath of God. This is super cool. Really, really funny. But, I mean, still... It's not going to solve Peter's problems, but it is a very cool move, Peter. I like it. There is another, the last Surrender of Retier. I mean, I wonder how long it's going to live. 
And okay, there's a time walk. Okay, okay, that's something. That's something. Remember, Peter's on eight, so you know, Rob's almost there. If he can, I just untap. And this is, just, I mean, this is one of these weird games where you're like, shouldn't it been, shouldn't it have been over sooner? But sometimes this is the way it goes. You know, if you only draw answers, if you cannot draw your threats. And then you can still control the game, but you cannot just, you know, win it. But now Peter's on five, so the end is near for Peter here in game number one. It's just game number one. There's a Cyblast going to drop to one. ay 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 Rob's going to drop to... Actually, he needs to take two damage from the Cyblast, I believe. But it doesn't matter anyway. Okay, he's winning game one. I mean, come on. This was endless. I think, Rob, you played out all your lands in your deck, or you discarded them in your graveyard, one or the other. But... Man, so many lands. And also, Peter, you were on a huge land pocket. I loved your play with Soul Net Wrath of God. That was very classy. I also really enjoyed your balance play. So um, anyway, both players are going to go into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. After that crazy game one, it is Peter on the play, starting with a Plains and Pass turn. So no um, Birds of Paradise for him. Look at that. Rob starting with his beat-up Lotus. That is a great start. Also tapping. There's attacks. Ooh, second the Lotus. <laughs> oh, look at this opener. That's insane. That is insane, Rob. Okay, so I guess after the very long game one, we're going to get a very short game number two. Unless, of course, you know, if Peter just has a Swords here and, uh, you know, maybe just not do the land drop. So choosing here to kind of say, okay, you've got the attacks. I got to live with that. Playing out the plateau, passing the turn. So Rob taking a damage here, but of course he's got that active land tax. I mean, this is a dream start for for Rob. This is amazing, and uh, he's shuffling up again. I mean that opener. I mean Peter, there's there's little that you can do. You just need to have, I guess, a disenchant and the swords. That's all you need. You know, you can play you can play disenchant now in his end step or his swords now and. You know, he can get back into this, definitely. There's the attack with the Surrender. He's going to drop to 17. And uh, there's the pass. There's a mountain. And a pass. Okay, yeah. The longer it takes for, you know, Peter to find his answers here to the threat and to the attacks, the harder it is going to get for him, of course. And Rob dropping to 18 because of his own Surrender. Looking up the three lands, shuffling the library. Yeah, this is, this is just great. I also had some games against these Lantex decks where people would just start with Mox Pearl, Lantex, go. <laughs> that would be quite frustrating as well. I mean, Tex is just such a good card. There's another Surrender. <sighs> okay, I think, I guess if you're paid, you need your Wrath of God right now or you need your balance and then you still need a way to deal. Okay, okay, Bolt on Rob, gonna drop to 15. Okay, that's that's also a strategy. Of course, you know, Rob is taking a lot of damage from his own Surrenders. So there was that Bolt, so he's dropping to 15. Tapping to, okay, there's a balance. Okay, that's, that's something. And again, we saw that very strong balance by Pater in game one, and now we see a balance again. And I mean, he's getting some value. He's, he is losing a land. But uh, Rob is also losing cards. Okay, they're all lands, but still, I mean, he's, he's, he's losing them. And there's a pass. So, you know, Rob deciding, of course, not to play out any lands. He wants to wait for Peter to do it first. Peter is starting with uh, playing a Jade Statue. Disenchant, too bad. Jade Statue is such a cool creature. Actually, it's an artifact. It's a statue, but you can make it a creature during combat. It becomes a 3-6 Golem, and you can attack with it. It's pretty cool. And there we see... Rob here looking up Lance again. You know, and I, yeah, I do understand Peter. He wants to play his own game. He doesn't want to be held hostage by the land text, but it, it's difficult. One of the lines of play could be to say, okay, I'm just not going to play out any more lands now because I don't need more than four usually. And when I have my disenchant, that's when I'm going to play more lands. That could be a line of play. There we see a soul net. So it would be super cool to see Wrath of God Soul Net again. There we see a Mox Emerald and a pass. 
And Peter playing another land again. I'm not sure if I would have done that, but then again, I don't know what's in his hand, but he is enabling the land text again now for Rob. And maybe if you're Rob, you don't even want to play out any lands anymore. Oh, look at that. Does he only have a basic island? Doesn't he want to look up more? Interesting. Choosing to keep it with this basic island, and that's it, reshuffling. I don't think he took out all his basics yet. That's of course a nice thing with land text. You can choose how many lands you want to take out with a max of three, but you can even choose to take out zero and just shuffle. And in some decks, that's what you want. For example, when you play Sylvan Library next to land text, the shuffle effect alone is kind of worth it. Uh, another land again by Peter in the pass. And also a land drop by Rob in the pass. There's a Disrupting Scepter. He's got enough mana to use it straight away. Are we gonna, yeah, there's the counter spell though. And again, very interesting, when this second game started, I said maybe it's going to be a very quick one with that Lotus, Lantex, and Surrender Perfeet, but Peter managed to get back into it with the balance. There's a Disenchant again on the statue. That is so unfortunate. The Jade statue just cannot stick. Then again, I mean, if Rob uses all his Disenchants on the statue, then maybe when he draws a gem, they told me he doesn't have any Disenchants left, so it's not too bad. And Rob again going through his deck using the land tax. Gonna find some more basics. It's gonna shuffle up again. So there are still basics in that deck. And let's see if he can find a creature. Okay, Savannah Lines, that's something. We didn't see a single line in game one. Which was pretty weird, because I, I felt like Rob was going through his whole deck that game, but didn't see a single Lions, I believe. And he is playing with four of those. Just a pass by Pater, attacker with the Lion, Pater dropping to 12. And here you can kind of see the strength of having counter magic, disenchant swords. It's so hard for your opponent to get anything actually to stick on the board. Like I'm expecting a counter spell or a disenchant on this as well. Here you go. There you've got the Disenchant. The Hive, actually a great card against the Savannah Line, right? Because you can just make a token that, that blocks the line, the line dies and you lose the token, but you can remake it. Okay, there we see a Swords here on the Savannah Lines. So that's something. There we see a Chaos Orb and a Pass. So there are just so many answers in the deck of Rob, which is super annoying to play against. But it's, it, it's obviously what makes white-blue such a great control color combination. There we see another planes and a pass. And Peter again, eh, just like in game one, at a certain point he's through he's, he's all of his resources and he can't really do anything anymore. Here we see the Surrender of Jin by Rob. So there's our 5-6 powerhouse again. Which is pretty sweet. And Rob pointing out the synergy between Lantex and the Surrendered Jinn here. So he's going to start sacking his lands to the Surrendered Jinn and that will help him activate the Lantex. There's a Chum Block and he gains a life from his own bird. I mean, he's got enough mana, so why wouldn't he Chum Block? There is a Strip Mine and a Pass. There is another bird. Okay, I mean... He can block it again on the bird. He's going to lose a planes again. He's got so many lands, so he really doesn't mind. There's the attack. Like the hive would have been great right now because with the hive, he could create tokens to keep blocking the surrender and kind of forcing Rob to sack all his lands. But then, of course, Rob probably would have used his chaos sword. But still, it, it is a pretty good weapon against the surrender up uh, Jin, I guess, the hive. And the cool thing about the tokens and regulation is that tokens now actually go to the graveyard before they kind of disappear. So if you've got a soul net and your token dies, you can actually pay one and gain a life from that. So that's a, a recent ruling change. There's an attack again, so he's going to drop to nine here. And there's the passer up. You know, he knows he's controlling the board with his one surrender. There's no need for him to play out anything more. Wrath of God, though. Wrath of God. 
counterspell mana drain on the wrath. Oh. That is unfortunate. And a side blast. He's going to drop to five. Because he's on nine. He's going to drop to five. And he's going to die to the Sarandip. He's going to untap. Yeah, he's showing the rest of his, uh, of his hand. And he's won this one with Sarandip Jin. That is style points, my man, Rob. Thank you for bringing your Sarandip Texas deck to the table. And also a big thank you to Peter. You have a beautiful deck. And... You, you you did your best, man. You did your best. I loved your, your balance play with that uh, Birds of Paradise in game number one. That was absolutely epic. But Rob winning here. He's got the stronger deck today. Winning at the Camel Trophy. Winning this game because we're still in the Swiss round. If you enjoyed these matches, by the way, make sure to tune in next week again. Because then we have more action from the Camel Trophy. And that was the episode of today. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please let me know by liking, leaving a comment and sharing it on your socials. All these things are completely free and it really help the channel move forward. And if you're new to the channel, welcome to Old School, welcome to Timmy Talks. Please take a moment to subscribe and ring that bell. Okay, and now there's one last thing that I would like to tell you before you go away, uh, and that is please take a moment to have a look at my Patreon page because Timmy Talks has its own Patreon page. You can find it on patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And through Patreon, you can support the channel financially. So if you want to help me keep the channel afloat, please consider becoming a patron. It already starts with $1 a month. And the cool thing is, with that dollar, you can actually join the Timmy Talks online tournaments. We have events every couple of months. Like I organize something to thank my channel members and patrons. So if you want to be a part of that, join the Patreon program. Like I said, it's just $1 a month. And there are some other perks attached to it as well. You get access to the Timmy Talks Discord and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. Somebody can see.